to hear um, Congressman Dennis Kucinich speak from uh, <laughs> Thank you very much and good morning. Sorry I'm a few minutes late uh, and I'm not going to be able to stay on because we have votes this morning on the Hill. But I appreciate speaking to you and being in front of so many people who are obviously ahead of their time on, on this critical issue dealing with wireless technology. And this is an issue of great interest to me. Uh, many of you know that as chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee, I held a hearing on this topic. It was the first in at least a decade, if not the first ever, on the effects of cell phones on human health. My interest was followed by a hearing in the Senate, which also generated some attention. I walked away from the hearing that we had thinking the evidence that cell phones could cause brain cancer was fairly compelling. It was far from being authoritative, but it was compelling. At a minimum, the current lack of research in the U.S. is not at all justified, especially since some estimates are that half of the world population uses a cell phone. One of the most important areas we discussed at my hearing uh, was the mechanism. The wireless industry likes to claim that the only way a cell phone could cause harm to the human body is by heating tissue directly the so-called thermal mechanism. This is the way a microwave oven works. But we heard some evidence that a non-thermal mechanism is at work. It is certainly feasible, since there are many existing therapies using electromagnetic radiation to induce some effect in the body using non-thermal mechanisms. It's an important conversation to have, because this belief that there is no non-thermal mechanism is presenting some influential agencies from being open to the possibility, uh, is rather preventing some influential agencies from being open to the possibility that cell phones and other wireless technologies are a real human health problem. Of course, I'm talking about the National Cancer Institute, mainly, who in turn is, in, uh, who is in turn influencing the Federal Communications Commission and the Food and Drug Administration. These agencies are using the conversation about thermal and non-thermal mechanisms as a red herring, effectively claiming that we can't move forward with any kind of precautionary action until we know the mechanism. Let me explain. When trying to link any given environmental exposure to a health problem, scientists like to know exactly how it is happening at the 10,000 foot level and the, micro, uh, and the micrometer level. In other words, they like to be able to look over vast numbers of people and compare who was exposed, who was not exposed, and show that there, uh, uh, show there is a link there. But before they conclude that the link is rock solid, they also like to know what exactly is happening at the cellular level. How are the molecules changing in cells to make this happen? Uh, this is called the mechanism. The scientists are hesitant to say with certainty there is a link until that mechanism is nailed down. And the mechanism is usually the last thing to be discovered, usually years, if not decades, after epidemiology first uncovers the problem. That's fine for scientists. But the NCI, the FCC, and the FDA, and members of Congress, not necessarily scientists there, we're policymakers. And we have to look at things that scientists don't. For example, we have to consider that we knew in the 1930s that tobacco was killing people. The Surgeon General didn't even weigh in until, 19, into, into the, until the 60s, and there was no substantive action on cigarette bans until the mid-1990s. In fact, there are many places in the U.S. where you can still smoke in public places, even though it's pretty well established that people die from exposure to uh, cigarette smoke. It's not an action, uh, accident that almost 70 years have passed, and we're still fighting to protect public health from tobacco. That was the result of a sophisticated campaign to manufacture doubt in the mind of the public about the link between cigarettes and health. What we have to consider as policymakers, not scientists, is this. How many people died between the time that we knew tobacco caused cancer and dozens of other major lethal health problems and the time policymakers took action to protect the public and educate them? According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 
Each year, an estimated 443,000 people die prematurely from smoking or exposure to secondhand smoke, and another 8.6 million live with serious illness caused by smoking. So yes, let's talk about what non-thermal mechanisms are. But let's not, uh, but let's not let the discussion get in the way when millions of lives are at stake. If we see a danger, even a potential danger to human health, we must act to protect health before acting to protect profits. I announced I would be introducing a bill that would do three things. It would reestablish a research program in the U.S. to look at the health effects of cell phones. Almost all meaningful research in the field is now done overseas, except for a few selected pockets of places like the University of Washington and Cleveland Clinic. Second, the bill would call for a real measure of exposure to replace the inaccurate, misleading, and downright false numbers used now to depict exposure levels. You know this measurement as the specific absorption rate, or SAR, and it is mostly not accessible in places that are invisible to the consumer as they shop for phones. The SAR has multiple problems. Among uh, them is that they're designed for adults, not children. They ignore the fields created by phones that use increasing, uh, increasing amounts of power, increasing amounts of power which smartphones do. And the science has developed significantly since the standards were set, mostly by engineers, not by people with medical training. The third thing the bill would do is to call for a label on cell phones, using the new measure of exposure that is created under the bill. Until we can say with greater certainty whether this is a link between electromagnetic radiation and various health problems, the consumers should be able to decide what they want. But markets are not truly free when a consumer has inadequate information. As it stands, the consumer cannot practically know what a particular phone or smartphone would expose them to. First, uh, the SAR is obsolete, as I mentioned. Second, even if it were useful, the SAR cannot be readily accessed when buying the cell phone. We need labels. The bill has already accumulated co-sponsors, and I'm waiting for the right moment to introduce it. It's not going to be easy to make the legislative process uh, work in this case because of the enormous financial resources the industry has at its disposal. They've already tried a few tricks to uh, get us to pony up information about the bill's contents, timing, and strategy. But I'm convinced that we can make legislative progress anyway. We just have to be very strategic about it. I'm also keeping a close eye on the other uses for wireless technology. Certainly, there are a lot of questions about the dangers posed by towers. Increasingly, we're seeing popular resistance to smart meters, as well as the additional exposure they cost. And the wireless spectrum is being sold off to make room for more wireless gadgets like keyboards. The use of radio frequency spectrum is one of three emerging technologies that are proof for the maxim that we're developing technology faster than our ability to manage it. Matter of fact, I think it was Alfred North White who once wrote that the greatest technological developments in society are processes, or of mankind are processes that all but destroy the society in which they occur. Now, another textbook ca uh, case is nanotechnology, which is proliferating by leaps and bounds, while research on the effects on the environment and health is slowly lumbering along. Well, little research we have seen today is deeply concerning. The third case, of course, is genetically engineered food, another topic which I've held hearings on. Uh, where, yes. you know, and, uh, food was in 19, 1992, the Food and Drug Administration uh, decided that genetically modified food is the functional equivalent of conventional food. Yes. Uh, they did that without any uh, scientific basis. It was really pressure from the industry on the outgoing Bush administration. And so, now uh, we have genetically engineered products everywhere. It's another case of, of not uh, observing a precautionary principle in the face of an emerging technology. Now in each of these cases, any progress that has been made has only come as a result of a thoughtful, dedicated few who have raised the hard questions for industry and for policymakers. And it's, that's why it's a privilege to join you. And, and I would dare say that the same kind of deferment that we're seeing today in Wall Street across the country is really uh, a challenge uh, to the rejection of the uh, corporate domination of our political process that has produced uh, these technologies that proliferate while the study of health effects lasts. But I think that there's this greater awareness that's occurring all over the country 
about the uh, hegemony of corporate interests and their adverse effect on public interest is causing people to look very deeply, not only on the issues that you're looking at in terms of the uh, cellular technology and so many other things that we're working on. So uh, I was privileged to join you in your efforts to uh, put public health to profit, and I want to thank you again for the invitation to share some time with you.